is we all know that in August 1, uh, we're into a different grain marketing world. The single desk that has existed in the past is, will be eliminated and there will be a new uh, uh, system and form of grain marketing in Canada. Uh, so we thought it, uh, from, the, from the general farm organization's perspective, uh, perhaps important that we bring some speakers uh, who can clarify uh, what that new system may work, look like and how uh, farmers need to uh, operate within it. So uh, our, our first speaker today is Dr. Frane Olson from the uh, uh, North Dakota S uh, State University Extension Services. I want to give you a general sense for some of the things that are happening in the U.S. and the U.S. grain marketing system. Uh, most people that I talk to, and I tend to agree with this, is that as the Canadian system moves to a, a dual market system, or however you want to classify, non-central desk selling, whatever the, the terminology you want to use, that the system in Canada will migrate and become more similar to the ones in the U.S. And I'm not saying that they're going to become identical, because I don't think they will do that. Your system has some unique thing characteristics versus ours. But they will become more similar. So by looking at what's happening in the U.S., I think you can get a preview for some of the things. And I want to specifically talk about some of the quality factors, because the grading standards in the U.S. and Canada are slightly different. I also want to talk briefly about those futures-based contracts. Now, they'd be similar to what's happening in Canola, but there are some differences. And I want to try and point out what might be different versus uh, 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 spring wheat in particular versus canola. And most importantly, trying to answer your questions. So again, if there is something, chime in, holler out, you know, I'll do my best to try and feel it. And if I get this timed out right, we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end as well. I just want to briefly update everybody so that we have a perspective of where does wheat, barley, and durum fit within the U U.S. marketing system. So if we look at the size of the U.S. crop, and this is just planted acreage now. If we look at the size of the U.S. crop, you can see how corn and soybeans get so much attention in the States. More importantly, when we break it down into the six different classes of wheat that we produce in the U.S., you get even a little different perspective. And recognizing that hard red winter wheat is, from an acreage standpoint, the largest acreage base as well as the largest bushel base. And again, that tends to be grown in the southern plains of the U.S. Hard red spring wheat, that's the northern plains. That's North Dakota, Montana, Minnesota, primarily. From an acreage base as well as a bushel standpoint, that is the second largest. Then we move to soft red winter wheat. Soft red winter wheat is primarily from uh, kind of southern Missouri through Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, up into Michigan. It's kind of the central corn belt. Then we have white wheat, which is primarily out in the Pacific Northwest. And finally, we have Durham on top. Now, again, to put this in relative size to give you a comparison of what Canada is like, and these are very crude rules of thumb, but I want to put them out there. If you look at all wheat, if we look at wheat as wheat, and we don't count what kind of classes, the U.S. produces approximately twice the bushels that Canada does, give or take a little. But if you look specifically at hard red spring wheat, Canada produces about 50% more bushels of spring wheat than the U.S. does. If you look at Durham, look at U.S. Durham versus Canadian Durham, bushels-wise, Canadians produce uh, 1.4 to 2 times the bushels that we do in the States. So for particular classes of wheat, you guys really are the dominant player. If we look, think of wheat, just aggregate wheat, we tend to have more bushels. But we have these different classes. Now this is acreage. Let's look at bushels. Oh, excuse me, uh, before I go on. Understanding also that the corn and soybeans are traded on Chicago Board of Trade. Anybody that's dealing with canola understands what Chicago soybeans are doing, right? Because those two oil seeds are, you know, they're link, linked at the hip. But also understand we have different classes of wheat and therefore we have different trading platforms for the wheat classes. So Kansas City <coughs> Board of Trade is where the hard red winter wheat's traded. Minneapolis Grain Exchange is where the hard red spring wheat is traded. And technically, Chicago Board of Trade is the soft red winter wheat contract. Now, the Chicago contract, the soft red, is really kind of turned into a general wheat class. But if you look at the pure specifications, it's soft red winter wheat, even though that's one of the smaller classes that we have in the U.S. Now let's go to bushels. If we count bushels, 
How big is the corn crop? Huge. That's why that, the, the number of bushels along with the fact that we have extremely tight carryover stocks right now, is the main reason everybody's so enamored and focused on corn. And what happens in the corn market influences what happens in the wheat market, whether we like it or not. The other dynamic that's happened in the last couple of years as you think about the dynamics and the changes going on in the marketplace is the influence of ethanol. And again, I don't want to spend a lot of time about this, but if you look at the bushels of corn that go into the ethanol industry, it's about 5 billion bushels. If you were to add all the soybeans produced in the United States plus all the wheat produced in the United States, you'd come up with approximately 5 billion bushels. That's how important the ethanol sector has become. That's how important now energy is tied to agricultural commodities. So when we talk about wheat in the United States versus wheat in Canada, you get different responses. Wheat in the United States, it's, it's not rounding error, but it's not as dominant a crop as it is in Canada. Okay? So we have to keep that in mind as we move forward. So let's talk a little bit more specifically now about contracting and how that fits. In the United States, we have a lot of different contracts available. It's very, very common. In fact, one of my challenges in, in my job is to get farmers to pay attention to contracts because they're so, uh, have become almost complacent, become so commonplace to use contracts, they don't study them as carefully as they should. And it's used for both large market crops like corn and soybeans, as well as small market crops like, in North Dakota, would be field peas, lentils, flax, dry edible beans, pinto beans, navy beans. So all the way, we have a complete spectrum of things going on in, in the state. The thing you also have to realize is the contracts and contracting structure for the large market crops are very different from the ones for the small market crops. Because the small market crops tend to be very quality sensitive. They tend to be very end user specific. That's why we don't grow a lot of them. And the people that want them are willing to then contract for the production of those. So the contracts we're talking about in corn and soybeans and canola are going to be different than the ones we talked about for field peas, lentils, sunflower, some of the smaller market crops. So this is where you guys now have to wake up and start answering questions. Why do farmers and processors contract? Why do we even bother with this stuff? Why don't you just grow it and sell it? You need a market. I mean, you, you don't want to, you don't don't want to grow something that nobody wants, right? That's part of it. Lock in a profit. To lock in a profit, or at least at a minimum, lock in a price. Because with prices as volatile as they are, to be able to lock, if you see a good price up there, and you want to lock that in, obviously that's something you want to take advantage of, so that you can you can manage your your net income. What's another one? Think of, think like a buyer. Why would a buyer offer these contracts? You as a farmer understand why you might want to sign it from your side of the desk. Constant so why would somebody offer it? Pardon? Constant supply. A constant supply. Absolutely. Being able to manage their inventories. To know that they're going to have enough volume going through their facilities to be able to meet the bands that they have on the other end, right? I mean, there's legitimate reasons why we want to do this. It has to be a win-win situation, right? So the buyer is as interested in trying to design a good contract and offer it to you as you are about trying to sign one. So again, to formalize this, the main thing is to reduce risk, reduce the unknown. Okay, we're trying to lock in a price, at least on a portion of your expected production. And part of it now with the rapid, rapid increase in particular corn and soybeans in the U.S., these smaller market crops are saying, we've we got to somehow signal to the farmers that we're going to be competitive with prices. Because we don't want all of our acres disappearing. Okay? We want to ensure that the correct crop is growing. When I say correct, I mean what, one of the things you'll find out as you move to an open market system is that a lot of the grain that's bought and sold is, is traded on buyer specifications. It's not that the government grading standards isn't important, because it is. You know, Canadian Grain Commission has standards for number one, number two. But you find out very quickly that buyers can care less about what grade number one is and grade number two is. They say, that's fine, but this is what I want. This is what I need. So how do they then, the last one is, how do they communicate through the marketing system? You know, you may want to grow this, but I'm willing to pay for this over here. How do they, how do they tell you? How do you communicate with the farmer or a large group of farmers that 
this is what I need. You may want to grow this, but I, I'm willing to pay a lot more if you do this. Okay? And a contract is simply a way of being able to formalize that, to, to try and explain what's going on. So why do we even study this stuff? And part of my job and my responsibilities at, at North Dakota State is to talk to farmers about contract design and understanding what the contract terms mean, understanding how to interpret them. And one of the challenges I have, again, is that there's a lot of variability. Just like we have lots of different markets out there, the contracts are very diverse as well. And I've studied this quite a bit, actually. Obviously, what goes on between different commodities is different. As I said earlier, what the canola guys are looking for is going to be very different from what the Durham folks are looking for, which is very different from what the malt barley guys are looking for. So across commodities, we have these differences. But we also have differences across firms in the same commodity. So company A and company B may be both malt, uh, buying malt barley, but their contracts can be structured very differently. Why? Because they need, either need different things or they're trying to serve just different customers on the other end. Contract provisions change every year. And this is one thing, you know, you, you can never design a perfect contract. So contracts are all what they say, incomplete. You, you can never fill in all the holes. You can never list all the possible inevitable things. I mean, if you could, it'd be about six feet deep and nobody signed the thing anyway, right? So what you do in the contract is you specify what are the really the core important things we need to do. And one of the things now in, in 2012, I can guarantee you that the US um, uh, companies are changing is their, their policies on prevented plant. Prevent plant is, is that's actually a, a terminology used within crop insurance industry to, to recognize those acres you couldn't get seeded. It got too wet last spring. It just kept raining and snowing. We got all kinds of really poor weather. There was a lot of acres in North Dakota that just did not get seeded, period. My understanding is, as you get further south, that also happened on the Saskatchewan side as well. Okay. The contracts have specifications. There's what happens if this occurs? And in the 2011 contracts, the language is a little bit sloppy. It wasn't very clear as to how we we're going to handle this. I'll guarantee you in 2012, those will be cleaned up. They're going to be much more specific about how they're going to handle and treat these particular conditions. My greatest concern is, and again, this is probably more of a concern for U.S. farmers than it is Canadian farmers, but they become somewhat complacent. They're so used to doing this, they look at the price that's in the contract and say, oh, that's a great price, sign me up. And they never study the provisions in there to say, okay, now what do I have to do to get that price? Which is really what you're after. And, and if there's anything you walk away from this meeting knowing, it's try and read and understand the, the contract. And if you don't understand it, don't worry about it. Some of this stuff does get a little bit complicated and sometimes it's written in legalese. Ask a bunch of questions. It really isn't that hard. Just ask a bunch of questions and know what you're signing. The last thing, and I'm getting a little bit academic on everybody, but I want to set the stage. I also want to talk about the difference between a marketing contract and a production contract. Because again, this is kind of the full continuum. So I'm going to look at the bookends. Way on one end, we have marketing contracts. And marketing contracts primarily focus on commodities that have already been produced, and they tend to be major market commodities. So these would be things like corn, soybeans, canola. Okay. Yes, we're trying to establish price. We've got some basic quality characteristics. We're signing up and saying this is how much I'm going to deliver. Okay. But you as a producer, you as a seller, have a lot of control over what you do, how you grow it, what you do, it, when you do it. So the buyer really isn't concerned how you do this. I just want the end product. Okay. This is, again, typically for crops that have already been produced. Stuff in the bin. The fact that we have futures markets, and again, in many cases for these marketing contracts, futures markets are a base, a starting point. They provide a lot of flexibility in how we design these and what we can do from a risk management standpoint. Not only for you as a seller, but also as the buyer. The other end of the continuum, the other end of the spectrum, and way, way on the other end, would be a production contract. And in a production contract, we're still import, it's still important to establish price, but the quality specifications are usually very tight. <coughs> They're usually much more specific and much more targeted towards the end user. We're also worried about quantity. How many bushels or how many hundred weight, how many ton are you going to be able to deliver? In these, though, the buyer puts on more restrictions. They say, well, I, this has got to be for organic wheat, or this has got to be Nexera canola. 
I, I as a malt barley buyer, don't want any kind of barley grown. I'm interested in these three varieties. You can choose one of these three to grow, and that's it. If you want this price, you've got to grow one of these three varieties. So the buyer now is putting additional um, requirements in the contract to say, I am now very concerned about not only how many bushels you deliver and what the quality is, but how you're growing them. Because these particular varieties have certain characteristics I'm looking for, for example. Okay? These are also commonly signed before production. This is before you start seeding anything. Because so, you've got to know this stuff up front, right? And they are most common in the small market crops. So for example, are you going to grow green lentils or red lentils? Some buyers prefer green, some buyers prefer red. Okay. Is this going to be for oats for the racehorse industry? Or is this going to be oats for the human food industry? Those can be very different. So let's talk about quality, US quality standards. These are slightly different. I'm going to also talk a little bit then about the pricing structure. How does the US come up with a price? So I suspect some of you have gone on the internet and searched to find out what prices are offered in the United States for different commodities, right? Most elevators, local elevators, have really nice websites set up and you can log on and check all kinds of different stuff, right? They're very transparent about what they're trying to do. The thing is, they usually don't talk much about quality. They have a price quoted and that's it. So what kind of quality are we looking for? In hard red spring wheat, I'm going to be very specific. How, does the, how do I, as a farmer, come up with a price or estimate what the price would be for my grain if I'm going to deliver to, to you know, elevator A versus elevator B. The first, and first place I start with, and this is where the pricing system kind of begins, is with the futures market. So we look at Minneapolis grain futures. Okay. Then we subtract out the basis. Now the basis is unique to each location. Okay. So basis isn't a general number. It's it's really the, the price spread between the futures price and the price at your location, at your local elevator. And that basis, that spread changes a little bit. I'm going to show you some graphs in a little while on, on how volatile that can be. But there's kind of some general rules of thumb. There's some guidelines. On, normally at this time of year, it's about this wide, about this much of a discount because of where I'm located. Okay. After that then, we take plus or minus premiums and discounts. So we start with a base quality that's on the futures market. We subtract out the differential between the futures and the cash, and we start adjusting quality point by point. We go through each of these quality standards individually. Okay. Now the futures market, as I said earlier, really provides some a lot of flexibility. So it allows you to be able to price your crop before you deliver, or deliver your crop and then price it later. So the timing issues aren't as important as they were before. And again, it can all be another example of where we have a future market available. Now in the US, the standard test weight is 60 pounds. Most of the time we don't have any discounts applying until after we below, drop below 58. So if you have 62 pound wheat, do you get a premium? Nope. You got more bushels because everything's bought and sold on bushels, right? But you don't get a premium. Now if you get under 58, these, these discounts right here that I'm showing you are actually from a, an elevator that posts them, updates them periodically. These are just examples. Every elevator is going to be slightly different. Why? Because each elevator has its own little network or own little channel that it sends its, its, its product through. So depending upon who they're selling it to, these discounts can change a little bit. But the quality standards, these ranges, are pretty much industry standard. Okay. Foreign matter, FM, that would be anything that really isn't wheat or dockage. Dockage is usually just the weed seeds. FM or foreign matter would be something like rocks or stones or miscellaneous stuff that ends up in there. And again, that's not a big thing. Kernel damage. Was there a question? No. Kernel damage. Again, this would be could be sprout damage, it could be heat damage because it was in the bin too long. These are very standard. I know this, you have the same thing here in Canada, right? Anybody dealt with falling numbers? You're familiar with them? My suspicion is the reason you're familiar with them is you had some problems with it. No, I did a tour. Yeah? Oh, you did a tour. Okay, good. Excellent. Falling numbers, if you were to look at USDA grade standards, falling numbers is not part of the grading system. 
this is something that was developed within the industry to try and de delineate quality. Falling numbers is a test for sprout damage. Okay, now sprouting changes the chemistry of the flower uh, that the miller is dealing with. So when you mill wheat that has been partially sprouted, the quality of flour changes dramatically because the, the sprout, what happens when the seed starts to sprout, sprout, right? The carbohydrates, the starches start to break down and the proteins start to break down. What are the two main things that we're after when we're making bread? High quality bread, starch or protein. And trust me, the sprout, and when you and I as a farmer think of sprout damage, we're looking at that, has that, the green tip <coughs> started to show up, right? By the time that little green tip shows up in your seed, there's a lot of chemistries changed internally in that plant, right? And the milling industry finally figured out, you know, we have a test that we can do to find out has sprout damage begun. So, in the U.S. system, if you have a wet, rainy, cloudy, cruddy fall with a lot of fog and miscellaneous damage, I will guarantee you that the elevator, every load, will take a sample and check for falling numbers. Now, if you have a nice, beautiful fall, with basically no rain, lots of sunshine, the crop comes off in beautiful quality, they won't even check for it because they know the numbers are going to be high enough they don't have to bother. The magic number is 300. For Durham, the magic number is probably closer to 350. Okay, If it's over 300, they're not going to bother with it because the, the flower quality hasn't been impacted. If it gets below 300, then they start taking some discounts. Now the challenge is, what's the discount amount? So let me ask a question. If you, pretend you're an elevator manager for just a minute. <coughs> and let's say you have some loads that come in and you got a little bit of really poor quality wheat and a whole bunch of high quality wheat. What do you do? You blend it. Absolutely. You can take this little bit, dribble it in and you can sell it off, right? You'll, you'll take some discounts on low quality to make sure that you know, it's, it's not as useful as it was before. Now, what happens if you have a whole bunch of high quality? Now, what do you do? You've got to discount it. Actually, what you really need to do now is find two separate markets. You don't have enough to blend anymore. And you can, you can take the high quality stuff, you can sell it over here. Well, everybody wants high quality stuff. That's not hard to sell. Because if you've got a whole bunch of low quality in your area, more than likely everybody else has the same problem, right? Everybody's after the high quality grain. That's not hard to get rid of. What do you do with the lower quality stuff, the stuff that has some damage? As I had one elevator, crusty old elevator manager says, you know, that's the, that's the stuff that separates the men from the boys. If you can, if you, as an elevator manager, you can get rid of this low quality stuff and do it at a profit, man, that's where you run, run, run the home run balls. Okay. Well, what does that do for discounts? There is typically markets for the lower quality wheats. But if you've got a whole bunch of it, what happens to the market for that low quality wheat? It gets flooded. There's only so much that they can handle. So now you're looking around at alternatives. Where, where do we get rid of this stuff? So all of a sudden you can have one year, falling numbers is not a big issue. The next year, if you have a little bit of problem with it, you may take some discounts, like this five cent discount. The year after that, if everybody has the same problem, guess what? That can pop to 15 cents very quickly. And when I'm talking 15 cents, that's for every 10 points under 300. Your discounts can add up quickly at higher levels, right? Now, the magic number for where we can't use it at all changes. That varies depending upon who's buying this stuff. Sometimes the number is 250, sometimes it's 200. Kind of depends upon what all is happening. But there is a point where at some point it's feed. It can no longer be used for milling. Okay. Dawn or vomitoxin. Anybody have problems with that? Did the wheat board test for it? They did. They did discount for it. Oh, they had a blending program. They had a blending program. Again, if you've got a little bit of low quality and a whole bunch of high quality, you blend it off. In the States, at least in North Dakota, we had a couple years back, especially in the mid-90s, where we had all kinds of tombstone problems. We had huge problems with that. The Don levels, the, the vomitoxin levels skyrocketed, and everybody had the same problem. These discounts were just horrendous. 
Now for again, for milling, milling quality wheat, as long as it's over about two parts per million, you're safe. If it gets below two parts per million, then all of a sudden we've got to be careful about where we send this stuff. Okay? And again, these discounts, these, the numbers I'm showing up here again are, are basically from last week. So that can change dramatically. After over five parts per million, then you can't use it. It really doesn't work very well for bread. Why? It's not that you're going to get sick eating bread. It's because what, what happens when you make bread? You've got to add yeast, right? The dawn kills the yeast. You get some really flat bread. Doesn't work very good. Moisture content. Moisture, I mean, if you've got high moisture grain, yeah, you've got to dry it. If you bring it to the elevator, they're going to dry it, charge you for the drying charges, but they're also going to charge you for shrink. Now, I want to point out, these, all of these discounts I'm talking about are additive. So if you've got problems with sprout damage and dawn, you take the discounts for one plus the discounts for another, and so these things can add up in a, in a very quick hurry. Anybody hear about the shrink, shrink charges? And typically what happens at the elevator level, the shrink charges are higher than they would if, if you were to do it yourself. And part of the reason is they're doing high temperature drying, number one, and number two, they're handling it several times. So they do have some extra breakage. And so they, they tend to have a higher shrink level just for the extra damage that's caused running it through a high temperature dryer. Is that your moisture for dry wheat in the States? Yep, that's 13 the base. And half, 13, and 13 and a half. Yep. 14 and a half. Is it? There's a few that'll take it to 14, but that's if they're going to put it in a bin and ship it out pretty quickly. If they're looking at, you know, longer term storage at the country elevator system, 13 and a half is the base. That's what they'd like to see. Now again, I want to be very careful. If you bring in one load of 13, uh, 14 and a half, and the, the elevator's full of 13 moisture, no problem. They may take a little bit of shrink, but they won't charge you drying for it. Okay? But 13 and a half is the standard. That's the base. That's the shooting point. Yep. Protein. Let's talk about proteins. This is where life gets to be very interesting. The base in, North, in the U.S. is 14 Pro for spring wheat. That's what the industry wants. Even though the Minneapolis futures market is trading 13 and a half protein. That was kind of the old standard. The new standard is 14. Mainly because that's what the export market's looking for. There's a lot of domestic buyers who will take 13, 13 and a half percent protein, and they're fine with that. But for the export market, the target is 14. And so most of our grading, if you look at a, a price quote from an elevator in, in North Dakota, it's assuming 14 percent protein. And we go up or down from there. Now this protein is one of the few things we have a premium for as well as a discount. So if you happen to have 15 pro, you will get a premium. The question is how much? Okay. You'll get a premium if you're the only one with 15. No, more, no, not necessarily. Well, the more 15 there is, the less premium. There you go. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about that. I've got some charts I'm going to show in just a little bit. The one thing I want you to also understand is even though 14 is kind of the base, if you have lower protein, if you've got the 13s or even below 13 for spring wheat, there's still a market for that. There are some of the domestic milling guys that will use that and actually prefer some of that, depending upon what kind of product they're trying to make. Okay, but there's others, domestic millers, that really want the high protein. So if you're going to make pizza dough, you have to have really high protein wheat. If you're going to make plain old pan bread, just the loaf bread you get in the, in the grocery store, protein's important, but you can get by with some lower protein spring wheat. Okay. The export market, again, depending upon who you're selling it to, what country, what they're going to use it for, will have these different standards. So the wheat market is pretty sophisticated in what they're looking for. And they, you know, over the years, have figured out how to make this thing work. So it really is the final use that we have to be concerned about. And you as a farmer aren't necessarily going to know that because the elevator, part of their job is to find the right market for the right output. Okay. So let's talk about protein spreads. This is a chart of the premiums and discounts for 15 Pro and 13 Pro wheat. Okay. Now... I would love to be able to show you a graph for a specific elevator, and there are some elevators that I can go to to ask for this information, but it's really hard to collect. Because they keep records of it, historical records, but it's in typically a three-ring binder way in the back room covered with about three inches of dust. And I don't have the time to be able to go back and dig through all of it. Fortunately for me, anyway, USDA keeps track of daily prices for the different quality and the different protein levels at major terminal elevators. 
One of the major terminals that we ship to in North Dakota is out of Portland, Portland, Oregon. It'd be equivalent to your Toronto, be an export market primarily. So what I did was I looked up all that information, I downloaded it, I started manipulating it, I subtracted out, so the price quote they have is for 13, 14, and 15 pro wheat. And I subtracted those out to get the differential. Okay, so the line running through the middle right here is for 14 pro. The blue line on top is the premium for 15% protein, and the green line on the bottom is the discount for 13 pro wheat. Okay? These premiums follow the pricing in Western North Dakota very closely. <coughs> so if you look at elevator prices versus what's coded in Portland, they're very similar. Not identical, but very, very similar. They're within a few cents of each other. <coughs> what do you notice about that chart? Two important things. They're inverse. Pardon? They're inverse. Yep, they're mirror images of each other, right? When one goes up, the other goes down. They are exact opposites. Not quite exact, but very close. What's the other thing you notice about it? There's a whole bunch of years in here where there's very little change, right? Almost no premium, almost no discount. And then all of a sudden we get into years like this. It's like, whoa, everything exploded. What's going on? <coughs> what happened? These are the last couple. Obviously, this is at, as of the end of March here. This is as of last week. If we were to put this on a marketing year basis, so let me go back one. This, the one I, uh, <coughs> this is just a time series, right? You're just looking at what's happened over time. If you take that same information and put it on a marketing year basis, if wheat marketing year starts in June 1, because we harvest winter wheat starting in the middle of June, okay? Way down in Texas, Oklahoma, they're starting to harvest. Now, I know this is a really ugly chart, so let's clean it up a little bit. This is the last couple years. Look what happens. We come along June, July, all of a sudden, August and September, we get these big, big shifts going on. What's typically happening right there? Spring wheat harvest. Spring wheat harvest. Exactly. So we come along, and all of a sudden, boom, there's a big drop. And then what happens? We kind of bounce around within a range, and all of a sudden, boom, it drops again. So what gentleman said right here, it all depends upon the quality and the protein, average proteins within the spring wheat crop. So let's look at what's the, on the premium side. Again, I'll clean this up a little bit for you. What's happening, we come along and all of a sudden this August of time, September time period, right in there, we get all the shifting going on. What's happening is the market's trying to figure out how much high protein versus low protein wheat is out in the country. What kind of quality do you have as you kind of start harvesting? Fortunately, at least for me anyway, again, fortunately, the, uh, some of the, the um, wheat groups in North Dakota, Montana, and Minnesota get together, pool their money, and they have a quality survey. So every year they take some samples of the wheat quality, and they test it. Not only test it for farmer characteristics, but also test it for baking characteristics. So they can do this as part of their market promotion activity. Normally, so 2007 was kind of a typical protein year. If you notice, this is for the entire U.S. spring wheat producing area. So it's kind of that northern tier, Montana, North Dakota, and Minnesota. We typically have 35 to 45 percent of our samples come in 15 pro or better. Again, 14 pro is kind of the target. So here's, here's a little bit above average, here's below average. And we always have a little bit that ends up really low protein. So there's 2007. Here's 2008. Again, pretty typical year. Here's what happened in 2009 when this protein premium started going from almost nothing to a little bit pretty, a little bit wider. We had a very low protein. On average, we were below, but the problem was we had very little high protein and a whole bunch of lower protein. Then we hit 2010, slight improvement. And what happened to those protein spreads? They went from bad to ugly. Then all of a sudden we have 2011, and they went from ugly to almost non-existent. Why? Because we had all this high protein wheat start showing up again. 2009 and 2010 were record years for U.S. spring wheat production. When you look at bushels produced, yield, average yields per acre, we had big, big yields, we had huge test weights, on average relatively low proteins. 2011, we had a tougher year. Lower test weights, lower yields, much higher protein. Does that make sense? If we have a lot of high protein wheat, what happens to the premiums and discounts? They disappear. If we have a bunch of low protein wheat, they pop back up because everybody wants this 14 or better. 
What about Minneapolis? Now, Portland is, a, is an export market. Minneapolis is more of a domestic market. We do have some export stuff that goes through um, uh, Duluth Superior. We do have some stuff that goes down into the New Orleans. But it really is a domestic market. That's the primary one. What do you see different about this chart versus the one out of Portland? It looks similar, but there's some differences. What about this area right in here? What do you see different? They open and close, right? But it looks as though the premiums are a lot bigger than the discounts are, right? Why is that? Anybody got a, got a theory on why that might be? I'm sorry, I'm standing right here. Right? No. Domestic? So let me, let me give you a hint. You need more high protein than wheat. You need to blend in your domestic wheat. Well, it, it, depend, it really depends upon the, the end use. Okay, so again, if you're making pizza dough, you have to re have really high protein stuff. If you're making bread, you can get by with 13, 13 and a half. It works. Where is all of the high protein wheat grown? In the U.S. Well, where, where in the, geographically in the U.S.? It tends to be western North Dakota into Montana. They tend to get slightly lower yields, much higher proteins. In the eastern North Dakota and into Minnesota, we tend to get much bigger yields, but lower proteins. So if you're sitting in Minneapolis, what do you got to do? You got to pull that high protein wheat all the way from Montana back this way, instead of having it hit the Portland, Oregon export market. They got to bid a lot harder to get that high protein stuff because it's further away. And they don't need quite as much of it, which means they can bid a little bit more for a smaller quantity, right? And still make it work. And I don't want to go through this in gory detail, but there are some differences kind of in this tends to be more choppy because they tend to buy and sell it a little bit smaller units. You've got you to have a lot of grain to fill a boat. <laughs> That's a, it takes a lot of grain. Versus a mill, their, their quantities, the mills, <coughs> typical mills are dealing with are much smaller. So I'll skip over this really quick. Durham, I'm going to skip over Durham because you guys don't do Durham. Malt barley. My understanding is you, you guys used to do a lot of barley, right? Most of it, you tried for malt? Did you get it? Some years, some, some not. Right now, there's a shortage of malt barley. Now in North Dakota, we tend to grow, grow the six row barley. We can grow two row, we can do either, but the varieties and the, the, the contracts by the maltsters really specify six row barley. So let me give you really quick an overview Again, 48 pounds is kind of the, the um, standard. The minimum is 45, again, typically for malt, and there are some discounts. I just couldn't find exactly what they were today. Skinned and broken, that basically how hard are you thrashing it. Moisture content is 13 and a half uh, maximum. Proteins. Protein, it really depends upon, even though the USDA grades are 13 and a half as the base, that's the maximum protein. Well, it's not maximum, it's, that's the base. Most malsters prefer lower protein, so some of the contracts that they have have uh, was specified that a maximum uh, protein level may be 13. They'll take higher than that, but they're going to discount for it. Again, the discounts right now are, are relatively low because they're really short of malt barley. They'll take almost anything that resembles malt barley. Okay. Question. Yes. In Scotch, when it's 12 and a half for malt barley, is the protein What's the reason for the differences between And I, I want to be very specific about this. It, it really, in, for the malt barley industry, it really depends upon the buyer. There are some buyers that are much more sensitive to protein content than other buyers. Okay, so when I quote this 13 and a half, that's kind of the, the USDA standard. Yeah. To define as malt barley, you have to have a max, at least, thir I mean, a below 13 and a half. If it's over that, it's typically graded as feed anyway. But there are some molsters that 13 and a half is too much. So it does vary, and I, I want to be very clear about that. Uh, germination, of course, what are you trying to do with malt? You're trying to germ germinate it so you can turn it into malt so you can use it for beer. If you don't have germination, you don't have it. Plump and thin, of course, that's just, you know, it's, it's correlated with test weight. Here's the thing, again, specific varieties are usually required within the contract. So they will, each malster will have, even though there are standardized malt varieties, some 
companies prefer certain varieties over other varieties. So they get pretty specific. Vomitex in our dawn levels. So trivia time, really quick. Why is dawn levels a problem for malt barley? Kills the yeast. Part of it is it kills the yeast. Anybody remember, you know, in the good old days of drinking beer when you pop the top off and once in a while it would foam all over the heck? Foam all over your lap? You don't see much of that anymore. You pop the top and it just it, it bubbles, but that's it. It was the dawn, it was the vomit toxin that was causing that foaming. It took a while to figure it out, but that's what happened. The thing that I got a trivia time, I just want to throw that in here. One of the, there's two important provisions that are in most every malt barley contract. And they're starting to show up in other contracts as well. The first is what's called buyer call. Anybody heard of what buyer call provisions? <coughs> a buyer call provision is you grow it, and if it meets, you send it a sample to see if it meets grade, you put it in a bin, and the buyer will call you up and say, we want it delivered two weeks from now. And you'll get paid after you deliver it. Okay, so it's not like where you, you sign a contract and say, well, it's, this is for harvest delivery. The price quoted is for harvest delivery. Or the price is quoted is for, let's say, the first two weeks in February. The delivery time is left open. And what the buyer is doing then is trying to use your storage facilities to help manage their inventory. I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It's just recognized for the price that you signed the contract for, your bin space may be tied up for a while. We've kind of always had that here. Yeah, it's called the wheat board, right? <laughs> I don't want to pick on the wheat board, the but it's want it. the malsters. The malsters want it when the malsters want it. Okay. The other one, anybody heard of this right of first refusal? So let's say that you contracted on a particular tract. Let's say you got a section uh, of land that you're going to use for malt barley, and you signed up and contracted the first fifty thousand bushels under this malt contract, and you produced one hundred twenty thousand bushels. I don't know if I did my math very well as typical yields, but just for, for hypothetically, right? Well, the contract and the pricing in the contract covers that 50000 that you, you specified. The right of first refusal covers everything else you produced on that tract of land. And what it means is the buyer continues to have the right, the first right to buy that grain. If they don't want it, they can release it and you can sell it wherever you want to. But they have at least the first shot at buying the overrun. The overrun is not priced, but it's typically graded and just very similar to what's happening with the grade standards in the contract. So just understand that because you, you just contracted those first bushels doesn't mean you have the right to sell it wherever you want to for the rest of it, if this kind of provision is in there. Some contracts have it, some contracts don't. So what kind of contracts use futures markets? Let's shift gears a little bit. We're going from the very specific to the more general. Now we're moving into kind of the world of canola here, right? But in the U.S., we do the same thing for wheat. So how do we set that base price for wheat? I just talked about all the quality adjustments, but how do we set that base price for wheat in the contract? Sometimes the contract specifies what the base price is. Other times you can just leave that open. This is a chart of the futures prices for spring wheat out of Minneapolis starting in January of 2010 and running through last Friday. Okay, so all these multicolored lines right over here in, in this range here are the futures, the different futures market contracts. Okay? The red line is the cash price out of Minot, North Dakota. Anybody know where Minot's at? Kind of north central North Dakota. It's the Suris River runs through there. Those guys were complaining a little bit about all the water that came through. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, why not? There's a, there's a fairly large elevator there, um, what would be equivalent to an inland terminal. It's, it's a major buyer of all kinds of grains. I just use that as a, as a nice reference point. But this is actually the cash price received, and these are the futures markets for the corresponding time. Notice what happens. They go up and down together, right? There seems to be a pretty strong relationship between all those lines, isn't there? But it's not perfect, right? There's times where the cash price is below the futures and there's times the cash price is above the futures. <coughs> the fact that we have a futures market, we're able to hedge, or we're able to use the futures market as a pricing base, can really offer a lot of flexibility. So what is the basis? 
Anybody can can anybody define basis for me? And I'm I'm looking for kind of the textbook academic. This is what I teach in class kind of definition. It doesn't have to be fancy. Just in general terms, what does it mean? Cost of moving the grade from the elevator to, the to a location. Okay. Or whether you're they, close. Or whether they want the grain now or later. Those so those are some of the pieces that make up basis. Okay. Basis. Mathematically, the basis is you take your local cash price and subtract it from the futures price. It's that spread. Basis typically just refers to the difference between two markets. What's the spread? Okay. Now, one of the things that creates that value, you know, if the, if the basis is minus 60 cents per bushel, what components go into that 60 cents? Part of it's transportation, part, part of it's location, part of it's a whole bunch of stuff. Okay, but the simplistic view is you take your local cash minus the futures. It's just that differential. Okay, and remember what I said earlier about wheat? We take the futures price minus this basis or the normal spread, the normal relationship, and then we start that as the basing price, as, as the base. Well, there's contracts out there where you can specify the futures price, leave the basis open. There's contracts where you can specify the basis, leave the futures open. There's a lot of different combinations we can use, right? So what factors make up basis? And you, you, know, you, you mentioned a little bit of this. Some of this time, the difference in timing. A futures market is for what? Delivery in the future. Cash market is spot market cash. You're delivering today versus delivering sometime in the future. So part of it is storage costs. We get some interest costs. Location or transportation. So why would there be a difference in the basis for, let's say, um, uh, Minot versus Saskatoon? Distance to port. Distance to port. Rail rates are different. Lift charges are different. Okay. And guess what? Rail rates change over time. Sometimes you get favorable rail rates and sometimes you don't. So what happens to your local cash price if rail rates change? Does that mean the futures price has changed? Probably not. So there's things that influence the cash market that don't influence the futures and there's future things that influence the futures market that don't influence the cash. That's why they don't always move perfectly together. A couple other things, and again, this is an important one, quality. The futures market could care less about quality because the contracts they're trading are standardized quality. The only thing negotiable in a futures market contract is price. Everything else is standardized, cannot be changed. Guess what? Cash market, everything's about quality, right? Cash market has to worry about quality. Risk, obviously risk influences this. If you've got very volatile markets, everybody has to take a little bit extra margin because it's just so volatile. I'm oversimplifying there. Competition. I mean, in Yorktown here, you're very, very fortunate in the canola market. Because why? You've got a couple crushers, you've got a couple big elevators, you've got some outlets. Local supply and demand conditions and local um, competition can really make a difference on your basis versus somebody that's located geographically much much more distant from, from markets, right? Market participants are different, and I want to talk about this a little bit. On the futures market side, you everybody, anybody heard of these nasty guys called the funds? Yeah, they influence the canola market, they influence the soybean market quite often. Who are those guys? Investors. What's that? Investors. Investors. What they're doing is they're taking, they're looking at saying, where can we make the most money? Well, we've got some money over here in stocks and bonds and other financial instruments. You know what? There's a lot of action going on over here in the commodities, in particular ag commodities. Let's take some of the money out of here and put it in here and see if we can make some more money. Are they buying and selling cash grain? No. They could care less about what's happening in the cash market. They're just worried about what's happening in the futures market, right? So there's times that the futures market can run up and do some funny things because these outside investment funds are coming in and the cash market's not going to reflect anything, right? And as they pull out, what's going to happen to the futures market? She'll come back down again. Now, you know, as the futures market goes up, the cash market will be pulled with it. Don't misunderstand, right? So that we do get this relationship. So let's come back to my graph. Let's take this difference, the basis, the difference between the futures market and the cash market and graph just that difference. Just the spread. This is what we get. Now this is a bit extreme, but this is recent history. This actually happened. This is not an academic exercise. 
When is the basis, that spread, usually the widest? Harvest. Harvest. Why is that? Why? Market's flooded. Market's flooded. Everybody and the brothers harvesting wheat, they all wanted to come in and hit the market at the same time, right? The, the cash market does not have to bid very hard to get grain to flow, do they? There's all kinds of willing sellers. When do we tend to see the highest basis, the spread, actually when cash market was above the futures? Spring. Springs work. Hmm, why would springs work have the highest basis? You guys got better things to do, <laughs> right? It starts to really getting strong in when? January, February, March. What happens in January, February? It's colder than blazes out. You got about six feet of snow in front of your end bins. The last thing you want, except this year. <laughs> the last thing you're thinking about is hauling grain. I mean, it's, it's a miserable job when it's, when it's really cold out. Well, by the time spring work comes, the last thing in your mind literally is hauling grain. So the cash market has to work a lot harder to get grain to flow, right? So we do see these relationships change. Now, this is an extreme case, but look at what happened. In, this is actually in Minot, North Dakota. We had a negative $1.40 basis at harvest. So cash price is $1.40 bushel below futures. By the time we got into May, cash prices were $1.60 above. Anybody do some quick mental math? How much of a spread is that? Three bucks. Three bucks a bushel. Now, depending upon what you did with your marketing strategy and the tools that you used within that strategy, you either left that $3 on the table or you captured a portion of it. That has nothing to do with what happened to the underlying price. It's just what happened to that spread. <coughs> Let me show you a tool. I am I'm a firm, firm believer in this cheat sheet. I call it a cheat sheet. Even though I'm a teacher, I'm supposed to not talk about this, but I love cheat sheets because I can. I'm getting old enough. I don't remember things very well anymore. I need something to remind me. This was originally put together by a guy named John Ferris or Jake Ferris out of Michigan State University. He's retired now, but he's, he's a brilliant guy. And what he did, he started working on this in the late 1980s. He kind of tweaked it and updated it and finally got it into basically this form in the, in the mid-90s. So what does this mean? This cheat sheet is really telling you what marketing tools work best in what environments. Okay? So if you think the futures market is going to go up, you focus on these two. If you think the futures market is going to go down, you look down here. Okay? If you think the basis is going to strengthen, where the cash market catches up or converges with the futures market, you look over here. If you think the basis is going to widen, where those two spread out, you look over here, on the right-hand side. So depending on what you think is going to happen to the futures and what you can, what's going to happen with that relationship between cash and futures, they lay out, he lays out and says, look, these are the best tools to use in that marketing environment. Okay, so why do I like this so much? It does a whole bunch of stuff. First, it includes stuff for cash-only marketers. So if you don't want to use futures, if you don't want to use cash, I mean, if you don't want to use uh, um, futures and options, if you don't want to use contracting, it still has the strategies. Your choices are pretty limited, but it says what works best. If you're willing to use futures and options, work with a broker. He, he lays it out and says, look, if, if you think this is going to happen, here's how you talk to your broker about what to do. The other thing is, and the grain merchandising system, the marketing system in particular in the States has been very creative. For every one of these strategies that use a, a futures market with where you work with a broker, they've come up with a contract that will do identically the same thing. So essentially what's happening is you, you work with your local elevator manager and they'll put a contract together that will do this marketing strategy you could do with a broker. The difference is if you sign the contract, you have to deliver to that, that buyer. Okay, let me go, I'll go through some examples in just a minute. The other thing, it helps explain why basis is so important, that relationship between cash and futures. And most importantly, it, it highlights the risk component to it. Because some strategies are relatively low risk, other strategies are higher risk. Now, I'm not saying risk is a bad thing, because it leaves, it allows you the opportunity to get a higher price. But it also means there's the opportunity for a lower price. Okay, so it all depends upon how how comfortable you are with this. Um, this is the main one. This is, I get this all the time saying, well, 
Uh, I'll talk to a farmer on the phone and say, well, this is my situation and this is what I'd like to do. And, and I say, well, have you thought about doing this? And I say, oh, man, I tried that last year. It didn't work for rrr, rrr, And I hear all kinds of funny words. And they say, I'm never going to do that again. And I say, well, you know, maybe you took a good tool and used it in the wrong place. And that's why it didn't work. That's why you got so frustrated. Okay. So using the right tool at the right time also has an influence. So let's go through a couple examples. Then I'm almost done. I have two more minutes. <laughs> I promise. Let's look at the upper left-hand quadrant. When is typically the basis the widest, and cash often catches up to futures? We just talked about it. Harvest, right? So this would be just after harvest. So what are some of the things we can do if we're trying to market our grain right after harvest? Look at that first one. Store. You guys know how to do that? <laughs> I can do that. We've been doing that for a couple thousand years, right? Not a problem. Or we can try and forward contract. But what happens if you don't have, if your bins are full? All right, so we're getting to the end of harvest. You had a big crop. You don't have enough storage space. And the elevator's gone to cash only. If you're going to deliver to the elevator, they're not going to store it for you. It's either sell it or find a new home for it. Now what do I do? You, you, yeah. on, the ground or a bag. on the ground or in a bag or something. Yeah, you try and find a home. Well, there's another alternative. And actually, this is relatively common in the U.S. And I'm finding out it's not as common up here. It's called a delayed pricing contract. Anybody heard of one of those? Now, this is a little bit trickier. And, and there's a good, good side to this and there's a bad side to it. What happens is you as a farmer deliver the grain and you transfer the title. So legal ownership goes to the buyer. But the price is left open. Okay, so the difference, you know, before, if you, go, if you bring it to the elevator and you pay for storage, you still own the grain. You still have legal title. The difference is you've now delivered it. They have legal title to it, but you haven't priced it. Okay? So the futures price is not established. The basis is not established. But the grain buyer now, because they have legal title to it, can turn it over, put it onto a train, and ship it out which is kind of what they want to do in the first place, because they don't have a storage space either. There's usually a small fee per bushel for writing these things. So they, they're going to charge you a little bit for doing this. It's not a free deal. The downside to it, uh, okay, the downside to it is that you as the seller are an unsecured creditor. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that if you deliver the grain, they have title to it, and they go broke before they pay you, go to the end of the line, right? Now, in the States, we have some rules and some bonding things that'll, that, that cover a portion of it. So you're never going to come out whole, but you're never going to be completely exposed, okay? Because we've had some issues with This is a very common contract in the States, actually. We've had some elevators that have gone broke in between and some farmers that have lost some money on the deal, okay? But it does leave some flexibility. Let me shift one more and then I'm done. Is there no time frame of selling? Use me on that contract? There isn't a 90 day or yeah, 90 day term or 120 day It depends term. upon the buyer. And, and this is where it becomes a little bit unique. Usually they do have some preferred time frame. Okay. And let me go back one. Legally in the US, if it's within the within the first 30 days. The, the elevator bond normally covers something happening. After 30 days, then there's this indemnity fund that kicks in. So the contract itself is really the question you're asking, though, is, is there a time frame on this contract? Usually they prefer to put a time frame on it so that the elevator knows about when they, when, what your thoughts are. But if you get up to that and you want to, and you want to handle it longer, you know, you sit down with them and negotiate it. Sometimes they say yes, sometimes they say no. But there's usually a paragraph in there spe specifying a yeah. time frame. Yeah, just, just to put some boundaries on it. At, at, at a minimum, just to force you to come in and talk again about what you're planning to do. Okay? But what it does, what that does is it allows what? The cash market, you've delivered here, but you haven't priced it. So what happens is the cash market comes up, and you're able to price it out later. Yes, sir, you had a question. Have, does the, the elevator, or do you, have they sold your grain? 
Yeah. They, they've already sold your grain at a price. Yep. So what are they doing? So how do they protect them? In that case, how does the elevator protect themselves against price movement? They're just hedging themselves. They're hedging themselves. They're using the futures market to offset their risk. They've essentially locked in their margin. Or they tried to. I've got to be very careful because they haven't locked in the basis yet. So they are. that's why they're taking a little bit of fee for it because they have some cost to managing their hedge account. They also have some risk that the basis that they think they're going to have to charge and the one that they actually got is different. <coughs> it's a long story, but they're, taking, they're, they're charging you something for risk is really what it means. But they have, they have hedged themselves in the futures market. So whether price goes up or price goes down, they don't mind. They don't care as long as they've got themselves hedged. So they want you to sell before it reaches that magic number that they don't care. Well, I mean, they're working on a margin. So when, when, they, when, they make a, when they make a bid to you, okay, so when they take their grain, you're, they're gonna charge you, and it's usually somewhere in that 10 to 15 cents a bushel range. Okay, and that's part of the reason they put this time frame on it, saying, well, in the next 60 days, I think the basis, the spread between cash and futures and cash price is gonna stay within this range. Okay, so they'll, they'll buy the grain from you, turn around and sell it to somebody else, and they'll take a futures position to protect themselves. If the price goes up and the price goes down, they gain in one, they lose in the other, but as long as that relationship stays the same, they're fine. Where they got into problems is when that relationship changes. So if they think the, the, the margin's gonna be here and it narrows to this, then they're in trouble. If it goes from here to here, they usually make a little extra money on it. Now again, it's not 100% of the volume, so they're on the margin, they're just, they're also making a little bit of money on the handle, they're making some money on the throughput, you know, they're trying to make money on the sale. There's another type of contract called a basis contract. So what happens if the basis is really narrow and you think that these nasty fund guys are going to come into the market and run the futures price up, the cash price is going to lag behind. That, that basis widens up. You're saying, well, wait a minute, I'd love to be able to capture some of the rally going on in the futures market, but the market, cash market's going to lag behind. What do I do? Well, a basis contract works very well. So what you do is you set, lock in the basis, you lock in that spread in the contract. And then you wait for the futures market to rally. And then when you think the futures market's topped up, you say, okay, I want to lock the futures in right now. They take the futures minus the basis in the contract, that's the cash price you get. So essentially what you've done is taken this cash arrow and moved it up higher. And again, the only way they can offer that kind of a contract is if they have a futures market that they can use that's liquid enough to be able to do this thing. And I don't, I'm, I'm running out of time. I mean, I'll obviously run over my time for the, for the presentation part of it. But I love this cheat sheet. Okay, and, and I mean, for farmers in North Dakota, I go through basically a whole day presentation just on how does this stuff work. Let's go through some examples. Let's work some numbers and see if we can get this stuff figured out. But I'm, I'm a big, big promoter of this. Um, let me get to my last slide here. Um, this one here. Just be a little bit cautious. Obviously, there's always cautions, right? These strategies assume that you have a pretty strong opinion about what's going to happen. <laughs> I.e., the problem with marketing, right? Now, trends develop. I mean, we, we're getting a trend right now in oil seeds. I mean, what's the trend line for oil seeds? Pretty strong, right? The question is, when's it going to top out? Everybody wants to pick the corners, right? <laughs> We want to pick the highest price possible. I wish we could do that all the time. Following a strong trend line is easy, but picking those corners is hard. Just understanding a lot, a big part of, of, of marketing is also risk management. It's, it's preventing from the disasters from happening. Right? There's my contact information. Now, I misspoke yesterday. I told everybody yesterday that cheat sheet was posted on my website. I recently rearranged my website. It's not there anymore. <laughs> But I'm going to share with the guys here. I will eventually get back up on my website. I've got a PDF version of it if you want to download it, print it out, and use it as a cheat sheet. And if, you know, I've, I've got it with me, so if somehow we can get, get transferred to you even today, I'd, I'd be happy to do that. There's my contact information. You know, if you guys got, you on your drive home, you say, man, what was that crazy guy from North Dakota talking about? And you got a question, send me an email or give me a phone call. Just, I'll try and help you out. Or contact these guys. They know how to get a hold of me as well. Nine times out of ten, they can answer it better than I can anyway. 